Let's turn to Ephesians 6. I'll read verses 1 through 4. That'll be the focus of our attention tonight. Ephesians 6, 1. Children, obey your parents in the Lord, for this is right. Honor your father and your mother, which is the first commandment with a promise that it may be well with you and that you may live long on the earth. And fathers, don't provoke your children to anger, but bring them up in the discipline and instruction of the Lord. Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, we praise you. We thank you that you have created us and that you have, in the case of many of us who are here and people who are members of this church, you have recreated us. You've made us anew. We are new creations in Christ Jesus. And we thank you for this. We thank you for your spirit that causes us on a Memorial Day weekend to want to come and worship you instead of merely recreate, but rather to be in your presence and be instructed by the word through your spirit. So we ask that this wouldn't be a wasted time, that your spirit would come, that we would be helped, that a word in season would be spoken. We pray it in Jesus' name. Amen. Psalm 19 is a very well-known psalm, and it makes a big deal about the rising of the sun. In fact, it says in verse 5 of that psalm, listen, it says this, the sun is as a bridegroom coming out of his chamber. It rejoices as a strong man running its course. Its rising is from the end of the heavens, and its circuit is to the other end of them. Now, somebody might say to that verse, what is the big deal here? Why does the psalm writer use such grand and festive imagery for something so mundane, something that happens every single day? It's just the rising of the sun. Uh, I recently watched a a fascinating time-lapse sunrise YouTube video of a pitch-dark landscape, skyscape, seascape, totally dark, but then it burst alive with that sunrise, exposing uh, mountain ranges and a coastal lake and rushing clouds. And on that video, all of this was serenaded by a dramatic full orchestra soundtrack, heavy on percussion. It was just magnificent when you watched it. But as you scroll down the comments on that YouTube video, someone yawned in the comments section. I'm actually curious. Why do you have such epic music in the background? It's just a sunrise. Yes, it's true. Familiarity with something astounding can breed a breathtaking contempt. And Think not of a sunrise, but think, (laughs) you could think about it. It's it's a mother who's recently giving birth here. Think about the birth of a child. Think about that. Is that mundane? Think about the solemn responsibility of parenthood. Well, sometimes we can look on such things as being mundane. In fact, R.L. Dabney writes this on this theme. He says, our perpetual familiarity with the light of the sun disqualifies us to appreciate its glory and its beauty as we would as if we behold it but once before we were told that we were going to go blind, we might look differently on the sun at that time. And thus we are accustomed to see, Dabney says, the child at birth proceeding from the parent that we are incompetent to perceive the solemn nature of the parent-child relationship the parent-child relationship. Now, it's really been about 13 years since I have given any extended teaching on the theme of parenthood, since that's the case, and since the children of that era are basically through high school now and even into college now, and since 
Children just keep proceeding from the wombs of Harbor Church members. In fact, you realize that well, we have a mother here who's given birth just about three weeks ago, and then we have the leader of the worship last week, Evan. His wife is giving birth right now at this very moment. Could even have a little baby girl by the end of the service. And then the man who led last week's Sunday evening service as well in the music department, which was Andrew, his wife, Katrina, gave birth to Eva as well this Memorial Day weekend. You see, births can be very common among us. They're significant to us. And so I'm going to be dressing with a few messages on this important theme of parenthood and the biblical teaching that's attached to it. And my hope is that it would be a word in season for a new generation that's rising up among us. Now, this message is simply designed to accomplish a single goal, and that is this just to make a permanent impression in the minds of all of us regarding the solemn responsibility of parenthood. If you're not in awe as you're a parent and you realize you're pregnant and you see the, the, the heartbeat and the ultrasound and the growing womb and the birthing room and the nursing cheeks, well then, that doesn't fill you with awe. Then the big food bill that follows will, along with the quick wit of the little one and the wrestling strength on the carpet of the little boy, uh, my hope is to awaken ourselves to the sense of wonder of what it is to be a parent of a child. And this message is just going to seek to accomplish that goal with four main headings. We could say four contemplations. So come on with me to the first Contemplate the God-designed accountability of parenthood. The God-designed accountability of parenthood. Accountability. Think of a boy. He's out in a field in the neighborhood and he hits a ball into Mrs. Smith's window. What does he have to do? He's got to be accountable for it. I did it. Take up responsibility for it. And likewise, there's a sense in which when we have conceived a child, whether it be as a father or a mother, we need to own up to the responsibility of what it is that we've done. Just contemplate then the God-designed accountability of parenthood. Two elements. First, consider you've ignited an eternal soul. You've ignited an eternal soul in the conception of this little child. There's an old... Frankenstein film, or Dr. Frankenstein, who unleashed into the world this, this creature, and in a particular scene, he realizes what he's done, and not fully comprehending, says, oh God in heaven, what have I done? There's a real sense in which parents ought to have that reality dawn on them, to consider what it is. I'm not saying in a Dr. Frankenstein way, what have I horribly done? But parents to be able to say, what have we wonderfully done? You see, there's, today there's a failure to appreciate the staggering significance of parenthood. There can just be this mundane phenomenon of childbirth, especially in today's throwaway perspective and culture. But through the instrumentality of parents, in this childbirth, in this conception that's taken place, mysteriously and wonderfully there is brought forth from darkness and nothing the origination of a human soul. And that's quite an extraordinary thing. God has given to man and to woman, made in his image, the power of reproduction. And that's staggering. That we as men made in the image get that power. Angels never got it. In fact, imagine there, angels beholding. Angels long to look into things, we're told in Hebrews chapter 1. And how they bend down and they looked regarding this mandate that was given to Adam and Eve. Something God never said to them. Be fruitful. Fill the earth. Multiply. And an angel may say to a Gabriel, he never said that to us, to the company of angels. Well, what is this power that 
God has given to man. No doubt they, they marveled that man would be so blessed to be able to produce offspring, to propagate rational and immortal spirits. And so likewise, we ought to just sit back and reflect with awe on this. If it's Andrew and Katrina, even now in Holland Hospital, maybe looking over at the bassinet, there's something inside that blanket. What is that there? Inside that blanket. Just to, just to ponder, a husband and a wife, it's within our power to originate a new eternal being and person out of nothing. Not that we create it, but we are the instruments of the creating God. What's in that blanket there? I'll tell you something that's strikingly in that blanket there. Something that you, you do not see. You think of the sun as being an extraordinary thing. A uh, sun is at the center of a solar system. What a glorious thing. But what's in that little blanket there, that little Eva is far more extraordinary because in that blanket, God has set eternity in the heart of that little blanket when the sun is going to be extinguished. The soul of that little one will burn forever. It will always be illuminating. There always will be a life. Because it says in Ecclesiastes 3.11, God has set eternity in our hearts. In fact, Dabney says this, speaking about the superiority of a little girl over a son. A son is nothing in comparison to that little girl in that bassinet. Dabney says this, the parent looks upon the tender face which answers to his caress with an infantile smile. He should see beneath that smile an immortal spark which he has kindled but can never quench. It must grow for blessing or for cursing. It can't be arrested. There is no power beneath God's throne that can retrieve it back to nothing should existence prove a curse. Yes, yes, the parents have lighted there an everlasting lamp which must burn on when the sun shall have been turned into darkness and the moon into blood, either with the glory of heaven or the lurid flame of despair. So look into the eyes of that little one. I, in preparing this message, was flashback to 1983 on a snowy night when I had come home, having seen my wife give birth to this little boy who had these beady eyes that stared at me. His name was Jared. There was a sparkle there that I had profoundly ignited. And, and I realized far more so than the little boy who broke the window, I need to take responsibility for this. So, so contemplate the god design accountability of parenthood. First, you've ignited an eternal soul. But second, in this accountability, you've passed on a sinful nature. You've passed on a sinful nature. We've not only bestowed onto our children as parents the wonder of eternity, but in a real sense, we've also bestowed onto them the horror of depravity. Because our children, they're, they're born in sin, and, and I, you, as a parent, you are the agent of it. It says that in Psalm 51 and verse 5, where it says, Behold, I was brought forth in iniquity. And in sin, notice how there's a finger pointed to someone. My mother, in sin, my mother conceived me. In the conception of a child, there is the passing on of sin. I'm not saying that we can identify the particular chromosome in the DNA, so someday maybe we could splice out that element of sin. No, that's not what I'm saying at all. But, but in this conception, there is the legal imputation of Adam's sin. Adam is the federal head. Adam is the representative. And upon the conception of a little child, Adam's sin is imputed to the little child who has been conceived. Like it says in Romans 5, through one man's disobedience, many were made sinners. That's the pattern of Christ's obedience or redemption. Through the one man's obedience, many will be made sinners. Righteous is that representation of Adam, our federal head. Yet, 
the active means of passing it on is ours as a father and as a mother. And we're no less guilty than our forefather Adam was because we in our sinful lives have personally endorsed and personally amened rebellion against God and we have verified Adam's representation. So you and I, as mothers and fathers, we are the instruments of God in procreation. And we have, listen, personally poisoned the souls of our children. Think about it. We have infected them with original sin, with guilt, with the flesh nature. Now, what more tender and dreadful and urgent motive could there be to prompt a poisoning parent to seek out healing and aid from the great physician? What have I done? What have I done to my child here in passing on this sinful nature? How could you, Mom, how could you, Dad, be so calloused to the ruin that you've transmitted on your own dear child that you wouldn't urgently do what's necessary to seek out his or her salvation or regeneration. Think of Napoleon. He was a ruthless and a harsh man. And Napoleon was plagued in his latter days with stomach cancer that eventually killed him. And he had an Italian physician who shadowed him. And the dying command of Napoleon to his physician was this, I want you, sir, to return back to Italy. I want you to visit my only son. I want you to shadow him and watch over his health. I want you to endeavor by every resource of your art to ward off the, desire, the, the dire inheritance of his father's disease, that he probably has the seeds of stomach cancer in him. Do whatever you can to remedy this. Now, Napoleon did this, loving his son, and Napoleon was arguably a very cruel man. But how much more? How much more should we as, as fathers, we're Christians, we are gracious men. How could we fail to endeavor everything to bring our children to the great physician of souls, that the disease that we've passed on to our children could be remedied? I still remember a time when our little boy Jared was about four and a half years old and he was hanging from a chin-up bar in the basement and we were counting how long would Jared hold on to it and I checked my watch and he slipped through and he fell right on his face from about six feet down to the ground. I remember I saw what I had done to him and I swooped him up and I walked around. What can I do to somehow remedy this problem. There should be that sense of urgency in us. If our little child scrapes a knee, we'll wash it out, won't we? If we're in the desert and a little child of ours is bitten by a viper, we'll tourniquet it. We'll suck out the blood, won't we? Well, the reality is that our child has been bitten by the old snake and we need to carry him to Christ, who is the great physician. And we need to do whatever requires to bring about the medicinal cure to our child. So it says in Ephesians 6, 4, it says, Fathers, fathers, it says, raise your children in the discipline and instruction of the Lord. Fathers, that's our responsibility. We're solemnly accountable. Mothers, it's the same with you too. You see this parent-child relationship, it's wonderful in the sense that they have eternity in their hearts. But it's terrible because we've given them iniquity in their hearts. And it's crucial that we bring the gospel to their hearts. That's the primary means of fathers and mothers, parents, bringing the medicine to them. It doesn't say youth pastors are responsible to raise our children in the fear and admonition of the Lord. Over the years, I've had people say, well... Could you have your youth pastor come and speak to our chapel about some biblical theme? And my thought is, our youth pastor? Well, all of our fathers are youth pastors. Take your pick. Which one do you want? You see, it's not the responsibility of a youth pastor or an evangelistic program or a summer camp 
or even Midsummer Lord's Day to rear our children in the fear of the Lord, but it's our responsibility as parents. Contemplate the God we designed accountability of parenthood. Second main heading now. Contemplate the God-ordained authority of parenthood. Contemplate the God-ordained authority of parenthood. See, such a profound influence over our offspring is bestowed upon parents that we are able to have great influence on them. Just consider two elements here. First, it's intended for a child's good. It's, it's, a, it's an authority. The child has been told in the fifth commandment, honor your father and your mother. That's the chief responsibility of a, of a little child, to look to mom and dad and submit to the authority. Honor your father and mother. And there's that statement, so that you live, might live long in the land that the Lord your God has given to you. In fact, Ephesians 6.2 says, this is the first commandment with a promise. So we see here there's a duty that the child has to submit his behavior and his will and his minds to the authority of parents. And there's a design so that you might prosper, it says. So you might live long in the land. In fact, living long in the land is more than just being able to live to be 60 or 70 or 80 years old in West Michigan. The land in view is the, the eternal promised land, the new heavens and the new earth, that you would live forever. And the purpose of all this God-ordained authority is that the child might be a, a captive audience in the family classroom so that the covenant teaching might be brought home to the hearts by the ordained new covenant prophets in the house, which would be the father who is assigned to tell the child the way of life. The child is to listen to the parents. The child is to follow the footsteps of the parents. So we see then if the child is to honor father and mother and listen and take the words as being heavy, the child is vulnerable to and at the mercy of your authority as a parent. For they're obligated to hear you and obey you and imitate you. And it's up to you whether doing that is a blessing or a cursing. Because we're obligated to give a detailed map to our little ones, telling them how they might get to their heavenly home. Shame on us if we would give them to the contrary a, a false map leading toward a dangerous destination or even a blank piece of paper so they don't know where to go. Just think of the importance of your child being put in your house. John Piper has written a book on providence. It may be the modern version of John Flavel's The Mystery of Providence. Just thinking about how God works in providential events and who would have thought that there'd be this interconnection between this event in my life and your life. There are staggering sovereign choices that God makes in providence. Just think of the staggering sovereign choice that God took your daughter or your son and put him in your bassinet and not in somebody else's bassinet in that hospital. I remember back many years ago, there was a couple in our church who were ready to adopt a little child. And they got the telephone call and they said, the mother is now in labor. And another telephone call a few hours later, the baby boy has been born. They named the child Joshua. They had the nursery painted and the crib ready in their house. But the mother had 48 hours where the mother could ponder and consider if she really wanted to give the child up for adoption. And the mother changed her mind. And that crib was never filled. And that little child was sent off to some other house. I don't know if the house was a Christian house or a pagan house. Um, maybe the name wasn't Josh. Or maybe the name became Moonbeam. I don't know. But the eternal implications of that providence can really rock your soul. And so you think of that little child being put in your little household. Is that a source of great blessing? It must be, because 
This God-ordained authority is intended for your child's good. But secondly, it's also this God-ordained authority, it's nearly absolute. It's nearly absolute, the God-ordained authority of parenthood. As it says there in Exodus 20, 12, honor your father and your mother. The power and authority that a parent wields over a child is so comprehensive, it is so controlling, it ought to make us tremble. It's kind of monarchical, kind of dictatorial, quite autocratic. We think of Hitler and we think of Mao and the way they had sway over the masses. Their sway is relatively mild in comparison to the sway that a father or a mother has over his child. You see, it's a sacred commission to impart and reinforce and prejudice a child's mind toward truth. I realize in our age where there are leftist whistleblowers out there who would say, that's a horrible crime to impose your belief system on your little child. But the fact of the matter is, that's the very thing that we must do. It says in 1 John 3, 23, this is his commandment, that we believe in the name of his son, Jesus Christ. It's a commandment. We are to bring commands to our children. Believe in the Lord Jesus. We're to tell them that. Like Dabney says this, there's no power allowed to any creature under heaven over another responsible creature so wide as this providential power of the parent. We as parents have the power to almost invade the sacred liberty of the soul. And we must use that authority and we must use that influence to persuade our children, to woo our children, and to tell them this is what you must believe. This is how you must live. It's not a responsibility to present to them a buffet of options so they can grow up to be a certain age when they, on the basis of their own choosing, can select what they think is best. No, it's a sacred obligation for parents to impose the principles of their creed on the spirit of their children. Listen, to indoctrinate our children into the morals and values and beliefs and salvation of the scriptures. I know you may be uneasy with that. Turn to Genesis chapter 18. Genesis chapter 18 and verse 19. And notice what it says there about Abraham. It doesn't just say that he is to woo or to make suggestions. But it says there in Genesis 18, 19, For I have chosen him, Abraham, in order that he may command his children, command, it says, command his children and his household after him to keep the way of the Lord by doing righteousness and justice. It says in Proverbs 22, 6, train up a child in the way he should go. And when he's older, he will not depart from it. And I know there's the objection out there. How dare I impose my beliefs on my child? Shouldn't I just raise him unbiased until the age when he can choose for himself? You might as well take a a Snapple bottle, uh, open it up, pour out the contents, and toss it out into Lake Michigan, and think somehow it's going to stay empty until a, a certain appointed time. Because the reality is, as our children go out of the house They're going to be filled either by the truths of godly parents or by an ungodly world. And it's the height of naive folly to think that we can raise our child in a condition where there's just a a neutrality because out there, there is the, the dragon, if we would use the imagery of the book of Revelation, and the beast, and the false prophet, and the harlot, and they're all bringing their Babylon philosophy, and they're seeking to pour it into our children's minds. So we need to be bringing truth with all of the persuasive abilities that we have. And profoundly it's true that that the season of childhood is a very important one for theological intake. 
They do, in a sense, reach a capacity when adults. So we should be ever pouring in truth and righteousness when they're children. Look at Deuteronomy chapter 6, the passage that Daniel read. Deuteronomy 6, beginning at verse 5 or at 6, it says that these words which I am commanding you today shall be on your heart, and you shall teach them diligently to your sons, and you shall talk of them when you sit in your house, and when you walk by the way, and when you lie down, and when you rise up. You shall bind them as a sign on your head, and they shall be as frontals on your forehead, and you shall write them on the doorposts of your house and on your gates. The truth of the scripture should be everywhere in the lives of our children. We should be ever lecturing them and discussing with them and critiquing the things of the world with them because they are very impressionable pupils. Dabney says this, there is, there is no power beneath the skies authorized by God that is so far reaching, so near the prerogatives of God himself. And for that reason, there is none so solemnly responsible as the role of a parent. So, may we not be stumbling blocks to our children by neglecting this responsibility. It says in Matthew 18, better if a millstone would be tied around your neck and you'd be cast into the heart of the sea than if you would stumble one of these little ones. May we not stumble them by our negligence. So we've seen contemplate the God-designed accountability of parenthood. We've seen contemplate the god and authority of parenthood. Now thirdly, Contemplate the God-given instinct for parenthood. God has not left such sweeping power over fellow creatures without an adequate safeguard. Consider two elements here. God has given a safeguard, and that is this instinct for parenthood. We can say, first, it's conspicuously good. Conspicuously good. In common grace... The Lord has put parental affection into moms and dads. Father love and maternal instinct. Someone has said, these are the strongest social passions to survive the fall. They're, they're almost pure and disinterested. One man said about these father loves and maternal instincts, these are entirely fresh oases in the desert of depravity. And because we love our children, it's a great fountainhead of good that gushes out of these things. Even the, the, the cruelest man in the world may grind the faces of his employees at his workplace. And he may even cheat his business contacts. But when it comes to his little daughter or his little son, he does whatever he can do to bring a smile to their face as mother love and uh, fatherly care is universally recognized as being virtuous. And so that's an apt, resonating, earthly type for divine love. As we see it says in Psalm 103 and verse 13, as a father has compassion on his children, so the Lord has compassion on those who fear him. He can look at an earthly father and say, I'm like that. Or it even says in Isaiah 49, 15, can a woman forget her nursing child and no, have no compassion on the son of her womb? Though she may forget, I will never forget. You see, mother love is mighty love. And even in the Sermon on the Mount, we're taught to pray, Our Father. And in Romans 8, we say, Abba, Father as we instinctively draw near to God, as God robes himself in such a, a wonderful parental love imagery. So God has given us this instinct, and it's conspicuously good to love our children. But secondly, it's also purposefully planted, that love instinct. Some, if not most of our passions and emotions and desires may need to be reined in. But, but this one to our children, it's, it's a very good thing for us to, oh, like that Midland Dam that we saw was swollen. And even before it broke, the way it rushed through those channels and how our love for our children must, as it swells in our heart, rush through the channels of 
Raising up our children in the fear and admonition of the Lord. That is the great design of the Lord in our caring for these little ones. They have a, they have a staggering dependence on us. I trust my mom and dad have a desire to do me good. And so we even talked recently about the mother and the way that she has a, a busy household. We talked about how uh, the household that uh, is like a barn without oxen. It's clean, but much increase comes by the strength of the ox and how a mother is like a ever-ready bunny or we could say an ever-ready sheepdog always following her children around seeking to guide them constantly day and night toward the destination of the father's house. And so that love is energy that drives us to raise our children in the fear and admonition of the Lord. And now just fourthly and finally, contemplate the influential season of parenthood. Contemplate the influential season of parenthood. In Proverbs 22, 6, it says, Train up a child in the way he should go, and when he's old, he will not depart from it. Just consider two elements here now before we go home. This idea of the influential season of parenthood. First, in view of common sense. In view of common sense. John Flabel says, A twig is brought to many forms, but a grown limb will not bend. So think of our little children when they are in their twighood. The youthful disposition is as moldable as clay. And so for our children, there are these plastic years. And we should make the most of these formative years before they harden in their teen years. Now, sometimes the hardening is good, for they harden for righteousness. But it's also possible that they can harden for unrighteousness. Uh, I've read more than one author who will have a couple come to them seeking to have help for a wayward child in the mid to late teens. And one author wrote, he said, apart from any extraordinary work of God, I can basically do nothing for you. Because he's working with an unbending bone by that time. So humanly speaking, I say humanly speaking, there are small prospects for reversing a parent's work. In fact, there's one pastor friend of mine who says, the most important years of life are those first two years, which makes us stagger and consider how we need to get to work early. Dabney speaks of pastoral experience and how it teaches us that parents' performance or neglect is the most influential factor, humanly speaking, to determine whether there's grace or godliness in a child. And then you think of when a child has gone wayward. He says that the success of a reformation or repair is much better among those adults who were raised in heathen homes than those adults who were raised in Christian homes. And why would that be? Why would that be that a, an adult who is walking on the broad road has a better hope of being converted if he was raised in a heathen home than one who was raised in a Christian home. This is just speaking humanly now because God is able to do whatever he sees fit. But the point is that the pagan child with all the grossness and vice of his life may not yet have had his soul poisoned by the lesson of parental hypocrisy. Because that poison that says, don't do as I do, but do as I say, that can be a very dangerous infection in the soul of a man or woman made in the image of God. For that can be the most deadly means of all for fatally petrifying a heart and searing a conscience. Because the child has discovered that mom and dad are a cheat on their God and they live a practical lie. They make a holy profession on the Lord's day, but on Monday through Saturday, that profession is disregarded. I've told you in the past about a Banner of Truth article that I read 
a number of years ago. Talked about a young man who was raised in the United Kingdom in a Christian home. He says, oh yes, my parents taught me much. They taught me much about God. They taught me that he didn't matter. Because all these orthodox truths that the child was taught from the parent's mouth, but they didn't see a connection with the parent's lives. So we think of ourselves, how better for us to take our kids to a a Buddhist temple or to a mosque or even go to the beach on Sunday than to come to Harbor Church and to teach them truths, but not live consistently and sincerely according to those truths. So just contemplate that influential season of parenthood in view of common sense. But then secondly, in view of a prophetic prediction. And here's great hope. There's this hope of the promise of the messianic age. Turn with me to Malachi chapter 4. Malachi chapter 4. It may well be that the Apostle Paul in saying, Fathers, raise your children in the fear and admonition of the Lord in Ephesians 6, 4 is somewhat echoing what is said in Malachi 4 and verse 6. Because Malachi promised in the fourth chapter that when the new covenant comes, after the great day of the Lord, there's going to be the unleashing of a mighty gospel force. The promise of the Holy Spirit is going to come into the world. Look what it says in verse 5 of Malachi 4. Behold, I'm going to send you Elijah the prophet before the coming of the great and terrible day of the Lord. And he'll restore the hearts of the fathers to their children. And really, this is the echoing of Ephesians 6, 4. Fathers, raise your children in the fear and admonition of the Lord in a new covenant church. He'll restore the hearts of the fathers to their children and the hearts of the children to their fathers so that I will not come and smite the land with a curse. This is a great promise that in the new covenant the spirit is going to come and it's going to stir up souls of Christian parents. It's going to come. It's going to stir up fathers peculiarly and it's going to drive fathers to care for their offspring. It's a pledge that they will be overwhelmingly interested in their children and that their children will overwhelmingly respond. And there's no need for us to be a baby baptizer to hold this promise this way. Because plan A for new covenant kingdom expansion is biblical parenting. Raising them in the fear of the Lord. In fact, Dabney says this, Train up him who is now a boy for Christ, and you not only sanctify the soul, but you set afoot the best of earthly agencies to redeem the whole broadening stream of human beings who shall proceed from him. That is, from a father till the final trump. So let's, parents, consider the solemn responsibility we have as parents and that solemn creature there that is in that little bassinet. May the Lord use these thoughts to turn our hearts toward our children. Now I'm not saying that if we work hard enough their souls will be saved. Not at all. The best of parenting does not ensure any salvation but just as J.C. Ryle says, we know that we can't convert our children. We can only do as the servants were commanded at the wedding feast in Cana. To fill the water pots with water And we may safely leave it to God, to Christ, to turn that water into wine. That's our hope. 